Welcome back. Well, we've been talking about World COPD Day. Uh, we're, we're really working on raising COPD awareness worldwide. We've gone over what is COPD, risk factors and symptoms, pathophysiology, the difference between asthma and COPD, some global strategies, and the beginnings of diagnosis and assessment. So really what we want to do is classify severity. When you're told you have COPD, if you're at a global obstructive lung disease stage one, that's much different from stage four. Uh, people imagine themselves as being on oxygen right away. Really what we want to do is stop that downward slide, and that means stopping smoking. We're going to talk about assessment of COPD, uh, uh, risk for exacerbations, combining uh, assessments, the comorbidities, and really, the, again, the differential diagnosis between COPD and asthma. So here's, here's what we're looking for. We talked about spirometry. That was that biggest breath in to biggest breath out uh, and uh, how much air you can get out in that first second. So if you have this 10-year pack history of smoking, uh, your FEV1, the amount of air you get out in the first second, for your age and height and weight, if you're over 80% of predicted, time to stop smoking. Time to get your flu shot. Get your pneumococcal vaccine. As we look at gold stage two, now you've affected your lungs. You're less than 80% of predicted. Uh, the, uh, you may be as low as 50% of what we'd expect. Hopefully, after a bronchodilator, your lung function is improved and the medications are going to be helpful. Now, as we move more severe, so my patients who are at moderate and said, you know, I just don't want to stop smoking. Now, they're at 50% to 30% of their lungs. So if you can imagine two-thirds of your lungs is thrown in the trash, uh, makes it awfully hard to get upstairs, makes it hard to wash the dishes, makes it hard to walk to the car, makes it hard to leave the house. And then that final gold stage four, the very severe, you really need to make some decisions about your life. Uh, the amount of therapy that it's gonna take, the amount that's, uh, of improvement you'll get even with aggressive therapy, uh, you've, you've reached some very difficult decisions and need to talk that over with your doctor. So when we assess symptoms, uh, we're also uh, looking at the history of exacerbations. The spirometry, of course, we want to make sure that you're, you, you're having this measured in, in terms of your uh, therapy, that you've improved or at least stabilized. The problem is if you have two or more exacerbations within the last year, your FEV1 is less than 50%, so you've thrown away half your lung. These are predicting a high risk for going to the hospital and even a risk of death. So we use that combination of exacerbations and spirometry, so how that air is moving through. And again, one or more hospitalizations for COPD should be considered a high risk. At our hospital, uh, we are uh, putting in place uh, through our uh, respiratory therapy program, a respiratory care manager. No patient will leave the hospital with a COPD exacerbation without education, without knowing how to use the medications, if they need a nebulizer, if they need home oxygen. And then we have a program of four uh, nurse case managers as well as two community health workers who will be doing home visits. The Livingston Visiting Nurses Association is going to be doing home visits. Uh, we're going to be involving people in exercise through the Better Breathers Clubs. So when we look at this combined assessment, we can kind of break it into those four quadrants that you see. Uh, we're looking at A, low risk, less symptoms, little limitation, uh, maybe zero or less than one uh, exacerbation a year. And in terms of looking at how you feel, uh, your life is unaffected. If we do a, a questionnaire, you can go to your car, you go out in public, you can do your chores around the house, you can walk upstairs, so you don't really feel a sense of, of breathlessness. Low risk, but more symptoms, uh, now you're starting to have more problems in terms of your activities around the home. As we move into high risk, so people who have continued to smoke or in gold stage three and four, uh, are having those two exacerbations a year, but still are able to function well, we have to introduce more therapy. As we move into the high risk, more symptoms, these are the people who we, we call frequent flyers. They're in the hospital frequently, particularly during uh, the winter months. Now, the other problems are that COPD is generally not found all by itself. We have cardiovascular disease. We have osteoporosis, so a loss of calcium in the bones, uh, recurrent respiratory infections. 
and not being able to get your breath will bring out anxiety and depression. And with that comes not complying with medications, not going to doctor visits, not taking care of yourself, not eating properly, not exercising. Diabetes, lung cancer, and what we call bronchiectasis, which is uh, the lung inside the lungs, the little hair-like cells called cilia. There's now scarring and that mucus piles up. It's like leaving a glass of milk out. It's just an easy place for bacteria to grow. And all those things will additionally affect that mortality and the hospitalizations, and they need to be looked at routinely. So having a primary care physician who's keeping track of all your problems, as well as helping you to stop smoking, giving you access to medications, uh, and getting access to home care, particularly if you've been hospitalized. So when we take a look between COPD and asthma, the COPD, we tend to see more of that onset later in midlife. The symptoms are slowly progressive, and generally there's a long smoking history, uh, maybe less so uh, the industrial exposure, uh, but we, we have uh, people who've worked in foundries and so forth. With asthma, I tend to see it more in, in childhood. Uh, and people can outgrow their asthma, then they tend to grow back into it age 35 to 45. We fall apart a little bit. With asthma, the symptoms vary more day to day. Because of our, our own body's adrenaline and steroids, the symptoms tend to be worse at night. Doctors close their offices, so fevers are up at night, coughs are up at night. That's your own endogenous steroids and adrenaline. With asthma, there's additionally allergic rhinitis, so hay fever and allergic salute. Uh, eczema, terribly dry skin, and oftentimes a family history of asthma. So in summary, really what we've been looking at now is classifications of severity, assessment of COPD, the risk for exacerbations, we combine the assessments for asthma and COPD, we've talked about the comorbidities, and the differential diagnosis between COPD and asthma. So we're going to be right back.